Encryption, what is it? How does it work? And what security properties do we need it to have? We're gonna talk about encryption, but before we can, we need to start with some basic terminology. The first term is called the plain text. The plain text is the message. It's the thing that hasn't been encrypted yet. A text message, an email, a video, a picture, whatever. It's the thing that you want to encrypt. The ciphertext. The ciphertext is the encrypted plain text. It's the thing that came out of the encryption function. If your encryption function is designed properly, the ciphertext will look totally random. There'll be no discernible structure. It'll just look like random noise or garbage. Finally, the key. The key is the secret that's going to protect your message. Another important notion is called the plain text space. It represents the set of all possible plain texts that the encryption function can accept. Similarly, the ciphertext space represents all the possible ciphertexts that the encryption function can produce. And finally, the key space represents the set of all valid possible keys. Now, encryption typically involves three functions. The first one is called the key generation function. The key generation function accepts a string or a parameter representing the desired length of the key and it outputs the key itself. Now notice that this is a randomized function. That means that inside of the function, there's some kind of random thing happening. So the idea is that if you run the key generation function again and again and again, and give it the same input, every time you would expect it to give you a different output. Encryption. This is where the magic happens. The encryption function accepts an element of the plain text space and an element of the key space and it produces an element of the ciphertext space. And finally, we have decryption. This is the function that's going to undo what the encryption function did. It's going to accept an element of the ciphertext space and an element of the key space, and it's going to give you an element of the plain text space. Now, there are a few properties that we want our encryption function to offer in order for it to be practical in the real world. First, the encryption, decryption, and key generation functions need to be efficient to produce. It's not going to be useful to us if encrypting an email takes 100 years. Second, we need unique decryption. We need the encryption and decryption functions to be inverses of one another. You should always get back the message that you put in if you give it the right key. Otherwise, what use is it to us if the decryption function doesn't work sometimes? Next, we need it to be confidential. It should be difficult to get any information about the plain text by looking at the ciphertext. In fact, as we'll see in another video, it should not be possible to get any information out of the ciphertext without knowledge of the key. And finally, it shouldn't be possible to recalculate or recover the key given knowledge of a plain text and its associated ciphertext. All right, let's talk about classical ciphers, old school crypto. This is gonna give us a nice foundation to think about more modern encryption and the properties that we need. First is the substitution cipher. This dates back to the time of Julius Caesar several thousand years ago. It's a simple idea. Take a letter and then replace it with a different letter. Here's an example. The inner ring represents letters from the plain text space, and the outer ring represents letters from the ciphertext space. Here's how this works. You take a letter of your plain text and you go look it up in this diagram. Then you replace it with the corresponding ciphertext letter. Instead of sending the plain text letters, you instead would send the substituted ciphertext letters. Now in this diagram, A would map to A, B maps to B, and so on. So it's not very secure. So what we can do is rotate the association between plain text and ciphertext. 
and the key represents the number of rotations off the original centered version. So if we rotate it clockwise by one position, then the plain text A maps to the ciphertext B. B maps to C, C maps to D, and so on. With a key of 2, A maps to C, B maps to D, C maps to E, and so on. For example, if we took a message like Hello World and we used a key of 3, what we're doing is we're taking every letter in that message and substituting that letter with another letter three spaces forward in the alphabet, resulting in a ciphertext that looks like this. Similarly with decryption, we're taking every letter of the ciphertext that we receive and we're substituting it back with a, a plain text letter that's three steps back in the alphabet. So in this case, rolling every ciphertext letter back three steps would give us back our original message. Fun fact, the English alphabet has 26 letters. So if you pick the key of 13, then the encryption and decryption functions are the same. This is the basis for a cipher called ROT13. Okay, but there's an obvious problem here. There's only 26 possible rotations, of which one of them is just the original one-to-one -one mapping. So there's not a lot of possibilities here. And if you were an attacker, you could just try them all. But here's another problem. If you look at this message, you see that repeated letters in the plain text space turn into repeated letters in the ciphertext space. So if all you had is the ciphertext, you could get information about the plain text. Like, for example, that two letters in a row were the same. And that obviously breaks some of the security properties that we talked about. OK, so here's an idea. What if the key, the number of rotations, what if it changed for every letter? And furthermore, what if we could use letters as the key instead of numbers? This is the basis of the Visionaire cipher. All right, so check this out. Instead of using a number as the key, we can use a pass phrase. So each letter in the pass phrase is going to get converted to its position in the alphabet. And now we have a number of steps that we can move a plain text letter forward by. And notice that it's going to change for every letter. So unlike the Caesar cipher, where it was the same rotation every single time, now it's going to change. So in this example, if the first character of the passphrase is S, that corresponds to the 18th letter in the alphabet. So what we're going to do is move the letter A forward in the alphabet by 18 spaces. That's going to give us the letter S. Now for the second plain text character, we're going to use the passphrase letter E instead, and that's going to give us a different rotation amount. So you'll notice that even though the letter C shows up twice in a row in the plain text, as does the letter S, in the cipher text, all the characters look different. Okay, so now we've got another problem. What happens if the plain text is longer than the key? Well, the historical way to deal with this was just to take the key passphrase and just repeat it again and again and again and again, back to back, for the length of your message. In fact, the Confederate Army did this in the Civil War. They used the passphrase complete victory over and over again. Well, you can imagine that the Union spies eventually figured this out and then were able to decrypt all of the messages because the key was being reused. Another issue is that they're using dictionary words. Now, that might have been a problem back in the 19th century where you had to do all of this by candlelight and by hand. But with today's computing power, we can rip through all these possible combinations quite quickly. But it's even worse than that, because if we repeat the key again and again, the mapping itself repeats after a time. So if the plain text has some kind of structure that runs throughout a very long message, that structure will start to repeat and show up again as the key repeats. OK, so what if we designed a cipher where the substitutions changed with every letter, but they didn't repeat? Or at least they didn't repeat for such a long time you didn't have to worry about it. This brings us up to World War II with the Enigma machine. This is a very famous cipher used during the war. It basically looks like a typewriter. The operator would press 
a key corresponding to a letter in the plain text. This would light up a bulb on top of the Enigma machine, which would correspond to the ciphertext letter. The operator would then write down that letter. Then the operator would press the next key, see the next light, write it down. The operator would then press another key and see the next letter light up and write that down, and so on and so forth until the entire ciphertext message had been created. Now here's the clever engineering of the Enigma machine. Essentially what happens is that every time you press a button, the machine rewires itself to a new mapping. This is accomplished by mechanical gears. The first gear moves forward by one step every time you type a letter. The second gear goes forward by one step every time the first gear has gone all the way around. Similarly, the third gear advances once after the second gear has gone all the way around. And if you're talking about a naval Enigma machine, there's a fourth gear and it goes forward by one after the third gear has gone all around. Each time the gears advance, the wiring internally becomes totally different. So you can basically think about it as being like a codebook. Unlike the Visionaire and Caesar ciphers, it's not just a circular shift, it's some kind of random looking mapping of letters to other letters. And the idea is that the codebook completely changes every time you encrypt a letter. So in this example, when we go to encrypt the first letter, we're going to use the first codebook to tell us what the plaintext letter Y should map to. When we push the letter Y on the Enigma machine typewriter, it would light up the letter V. But when we press the next letter, the gear turns and the internal wiring changes and the codebook for the second letter is completely different. Similarly, when you press the third button, it changes once again and the codebook once again is different. This actually seemed like a pretty good approach all the way up until the war. However, code breakers like Alan Turing and the cryptographers at Bletchley Park were able to identify some weaknesses. For example, the way the wiring works is that the letter A, for example, will never encrypt to the letter A. What that means is that when you look at a ciphertext and you see that the first letter is a Q, you know that the plain text could not be a Q. And that gives you a hint, that gives you some information. Now the code breakers at Bletchley Park were able to use little flaws like this to recover a great many messages sent by the German army during the war. There are many other examples of ciphers throughout history, but these are three interesting ones showing a natural progression. Now these ciphers are not secure by today's standards, so in the next video we're going to use that fact to help us build a formal model of security. So check out that next video, and if you like this video, hit like and subscribe. See you next time.